Hello, welcome back for another edition of our business ethics video lectures. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about Friedman and uh, Boatwright, two uh, philosophers who are going to be arguing in a much more, uh, I guess you could say, a committed or opinionated way for some of, uh, for an answer to this whole fiduciary duty uh, question that um, we saw framing in Hasnas in my last video. Um, and tonight there is no one in chat, so I'm just talking to myself. I'm recording outside because uh, I've got a babysitter over watching the little one while I get this done. And I thought I don't want to be a distraction. So we got a little different scenery for you tonight. Um, so, uh, like I mentioned, the Hasnas reading kind of like really just set the stage for this debate and gave us a introduction to some of the various positions and uh, the arguments supporting them, what's going to be their basis of justification. I supplemented Hasnas's analysis with what I thought were some other missing pieces to that conversation. But Hasnas did give a little bit of an opinion uh, toward the end of his article um, about how he thinks the kind of lowest common denominator here, the thing that all the parties seem to be on the same page about, is this idea of a moral authority of consensual agreements and respecting them, um, that there's a, a kind of moral reality there to be honoring, um, however else we're going to resolve things. And Hasna said that he thinks the complication in the debate mostly comes from figuring out how all those, uh, respecting all the myriad consensual relationships that happen in the business world, how you kind of balance those off against each other. Um, we're going to see some much more direct answers tonight from Friedman and Boatwright um, that are going to be argued for in a more sustained way. And so um, it, it'll be some other voices in this conversation. And most of the topics in this class are going to be set up in this kind of way. Um, you're Again, you're not getting readings from me for this curriculum because I agree with everybody here. So I definitely need to say that. And I want to remind you about the context here of how this, this class's curriculum was designed around exploring moral controversies the kinds of things that we don't agree on, we're focusing our attention and thinking about those things um, to try to understand why there is so much debate or why do people disagree about this. That it's not just the clash of opinions that people have for arbitrary reasons, but there, I mean, some people can have arbitrary beliefs, of course, but um, the beliefs themselves have affordances. There's the possibility of them being um, justified with some actual reasons. So. Um, things that they can say to why their answer is recommended over other answers for how to sort out this this moral space, to, how to understand the moral landscape of these issues. So everything we're going to be doing is controversial, which means that you always have to keep your brain turned on for these things um, and think for yourself about like what do you what arguments do you think hold water and which ones don't. Not all the arguments that you're going to read this quarter you're going to probably agree with. That maybe has already happened with the classical theories, which don't see eye to eye on everything either. Um, so exploring controversy is our business here. And that's what we're going to be doing. So these, these readings are not giving you the authority here about, like, here's what the morality of business ethics looks like. They are, like the classical theories, they are suggestions, proposals for how... Uh, we ought to think about such matters, and so they're going to try to shoulder their burden of proof about that, engage with their opponents, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what we're going to be up to here. Um, oh, I do have someone in, in chat tonight. Yay. Hey, Theo. Thanks for coming. Right now you're the only one. <laughs> um, I was hoping some people would actually show up in the chat tonight because uh, the way things went this afternoon with my 260 version of the class, um, we spent a lot of time just understanding what's going on with this fiduciary duty debate and especially the notion of social responsibility and w how the stockholder theory is like making a recommendation about this um, and then what its opponents are going to be it's uh, this debate is kind of like stockholder theory versus everyone else because the stockholder theory is saying um, we don't have any social responsibilities that's an entailment of their position and all the other answers do argue for some space for social responsibilities for business uh, business managers. Um, so we spent a lot of time doing clarification today. People, hands were just flying, people were asking questions. We didn't even get to like the arguments for quite some time this afternoon. So that kind of made me think maybe that's going to happen for the 360 students too, that the lecture video that I gave out before um, for Tuesday's missed class, because we weren't able to talk in person about it, maybe there are some outstanding questions. So 
Um, oh, and Daria's here too. Awesome. So Daria and Theo, um, I'm going to lean on you here as kind of representatives for everyone in the class who's not here able to ask questions on the fly. Um, and let's start just here, before I get into any of the stuff with Friedman and Boatwright, um, let me just ask you whether you have some leftover questions for clarifying just what, what was what's going on here in the fiduciary duty debate, what's happening with any of the um, positions. Oh, I just realized my microphone is muted. <laughs> People in chat, can you hear me now? Yeah? I think I might have just gotten a text message. Can you hear me? I know it's in the recording, so it should be fine with the recording part. Um, let me just double check that really quickly before I go further. Okay, awesome. Yes, uh, the microphone was not muted for the entirety of this. So, um, Daria, uh, can you hear me? Yes, no. Um, you, okay. Oh, okay, awesome. Um, so uh, I'm I'm asking. So I guess you're driving. So I I don't want you to put yourself or anyone else in danger here. Um, but I did want to lean on anyone who is in the chat tonight to see if they had any questions about what's going on with the fiduciary duty debate, all the stuff from Hasnas, stockholder, stakeholder, social contract theories. Um, we spent a lot of time uh, in my other class this afternoon just clarifying stuff from that. Hosnos lecture. So I figured there's probably some other people in our class in our section that have similar questions. So um, anything from you or uh, Daria or Theo, any kind of leftover questions from the Tuesday lecture that you could ask about? If you've got a question or if there's something you're like, I think I got it, but maybe not quite. I want to double check. There's definitely someone else in the class who's got that same thing going on. So I'd like to address as much as I can. All good. Okay. All right. I uh, well, I'll I'll lean on you as as much as possible. Be sort of as you're listening to me tonight. Think if you've got any kind of leftover questions about stuff. Um. Okay. So, I I think I'll I think I'll spend a, just a couple minutes here trying to clarify some stuff about the social responsibility concept before getting into Friedman, just in case that like I said, a lot of people asked about that earlier today. So, um. We're being very careful here with our definition for social responsibility. Hasnas is very careful about it. Um, Friedman makes a point of emphasis about this too. Boatwright is uh, using the concept of uh, the term social responsibility, but there's nothing in his paper that contradicts the clarification that people like Hasnas and Friedman are making here. But when we, if we just sort of informally think about social responsibility, we might be thinking about <clears throat> what we sort of owe to society that you kind of think about ethics in a informal way that there's like some kind of basic injunction about like making the world a better place or doing good you know like helping people um, that those are pretty common baseline moral values and you might think that in as much as you're in a position in society where you can make a difference like if you're a manager of a company that those responsibilities should extend to that too um, there's a kind of straightforward analogy there. Now, stockholder theorists like Friedman are going to try to interrupt that and say, actually, there's a disanalogy happening. But that's kind of the, the basic idea of social responsibility is just that, you know, a business or the way it operates like kind of owes something ethically and morally to everyone else in society. Um, not in this like really stringent sense of owe, but just that like um, what's right is to be concerned about what's happening with other people, like basic altruism. Just that kind of idea. Um, so we might think about that as what we mean by social responsibility, but that actually wouldn't be the best definition for us to work with. And the reason is that it would obscure how there could still be fiduciary duties of the kind the stockholder theorist is talking about, even for firms that are things like nonprofits. Um, I'm going to have to sneeze here for a second. It's springtime again. 
allergies are back. Um, hopefully, being outside isn't going to make this too bad. Um, okay, so let's let's think about it from the like stockholder theorist perspective. And I'm going to set up this kind of toy case. I think I think this case is uh, or this scenario. I mean, there's tons of examples we could draw on. Like one of the things that slowed us down this afternoon in my other class was just we talked about example after example after example. Um, there's endless examples here of these dynamics, which stands to reason this is a universal moral issue for business, so it's going to creep up everywhere. But there's a kind of, I'll, I'll give you one scenario that's kind of a toy case that's really simplified, and I think is probably the context in which something like the stockholder theory and putting this huge weight, uh, this almost restrictive weight on the fiduciary duty that managers have to owners that, um, that, the, this case is going to kind of show what's going on with that in a way that's probably the most intuitive, that lets you connect with the sort of rationale behind do, making that move. So, um, and it's also going to be helpful for understanding Boatwright, too, and how Boatwright's going to very much complicate this whole dilemma, this whole situation. But here's a basic situation. So let's say you own a hot dog cart, and you're like, you know what, I own this hot dog cart, but I'm kind of sick of cooking hot dogs and selling them all the time. Like, I'd love to be able to have some more time. So you hire me to run your hot dog truck. You still own it, but you just hire me as an employee to run it. And that leaves you some more time to, maybe you come in every once in a while and help out with it and take a shift or something like that. But, you know, you pay me so that you have more time. And let's just imagine for the sake of argument that I'm completely running the show. You still own it but I'm the one who is the complete manager of this hot dog truck. Now, if this happens, I have a kind of responsibility to you to run your hot dog stand the way you want it run and with your kind of mandate for what is the purpose of this enterprise, which presumably would be something like making profit. So if I decide as the manager now of your hot dog truck that I'm like, you know what? I'm selling hot dogs, you know, this is pretty affordable food, um, and I know that there's a lot of people in some poorer areas of Seattle that really could stand to have access to cheaper food options, so, and, and they're, they're like, you know, who, who doesn't like hot dogs? Some people don't like hot dogs, but I got vegetarian hot dogs too, all that kind of stuff, but it's like something nice too, so maybe I'm going to like set up the hot dog cart down in some of these poorer areas. And I'm going to get less business if I do that than if I, like, hang out in Capitol Hill on Saturday night when all the shows are happening and people are going to eat a lot of hot dogs, right? Now, my, that choice for me to be, like, concerned about doing something good for somebody else is going to cut into your bottom line. I'm not going to be making as much profit, and so, uh, you know, after paying me, you're not going to have as much left over for yourself. Um, that would be, in the kind of mind of the stockholder theorist, a violation of my obligations to you, the owner, that I've been hired to basically be your agent to act on behalf of you in how this cart is run. So I need to run it the way you want it to be run. That's, that's this kind of notion of a fiduciary duty, that I'm managing the hot dog truck in trust for you. Okay? So in that kind of situation, you're the complete owner, you have complete control over this thing, and you allow me to have control over over it in these managerial duties, right? Okay, so um, that would be for me to like do these nice things for other people. Um, that would be a violation of my fiduciary duty. In a, in as much as I'm exerting a social responsibility, I'm like the way I, I'm going to run this hot dog truck is going to be to try to make some more good happen in society, and not just about the bottom line, not just maximizing profits. That would be a great example of someone expressing social responsibilities. And the stockholder theory is going to be like, can't do that. It would be, to the stockholder theorist, me doing this nice thing for some other people in the city of Seattle would be akin to if I took the hot dog truck and just basically parked it in front of my friends and family's house so they have access to hot dogs all the time. Right? That, that kind of like special interest sort of thing um, would be a similar type of violation of my fiduciary duty. Um, so it isn't as though the stockholder theorist is saying everything that goes outside of that boundary is somehow this social responsibility thing um, in the sense of like doing something altruistic or moral. But the, the concern, and this is how Hasnas and Friedman define social responsibility, is just any use that the manager, me in this case, any use of the company's resources, whether that's money, 
or the hot dogs or where the cart is you know all that kind of stuff the the um the material the employees the human resources ev all that however the resources of the company are being used for purposes that are not a part of the mandate of the purpose of the firm which comes from the owners which are in the case of corporations or larger companies like not a hot dog stand they're going to be the stockholders okay so social responsibilities we're using in a little bit more of a technical theoretical sense in this debate as basically everything that is outside of that mandate and when we're talking about for-profit companies that mandate's going to be profit maximizing profit so why why are we getting so tricky with this like technical theoretical definition of social responsibility the answer is that we um, we want to be able to understand how there could be similar duties for managers of firms that don't have as their purpose profit so if I'm running a nonprofit if I'm the manager or CEO of a nonprofit firm um, there's some kind of mandate that I'm given like there's there's some purpose that that nonprofit exists to perform uh, some a function to perform and if I start using the resources of that nonprofit for some kind of purpose that isn't related to that, then I'm also violating my fiduciary duties as the manager of the nonprofit. We can still make sense of a similar type of there's there's a moral symmetry in these cases between you know doing anything that goes outside of the the purpose of maximizing profits versus outside the purpose of the nonprofit. For example, let's say I'm managing a nonprofit that is attempting to address issues related to homelessness in Seattle. And then as the manager, I'm like, you know what? Cancer's a real big deal, or the opium a a epidemic. So I'm going to start using a bunch of this nonprofit's resources to deal with those issues. Like, that would be a violation of my mandate and a betrayal of this kind of promise, of this uh, trustworthiness that has been given to me by giving me the position of management. Um, something else that came up this afternoon that I wanted to clarify for people um, we got a little sidetracked in the conversation this afternoon by people just talking about whether, um, like, whether there are moral responsibilities of businesses themselves. And you might have noticed that Friedman kind of goes after this, like, right out of the gates in the paper, and is like, it's just absurd to talk about businesses having social responsibilities or moral responsibilities of any kind, because businesses are people. Only people have wills that can have moral responsibilities. Only people are capable of doing moral or immoral things. Now, <clears throat> to a certain extent, he's right in a trivial way. And it's not like his opponents are saying anything else. I actually think Friedman's in danger of strawmanning his opponents here by putting those words in their mouth when they don't really mean that. Um, and I think he's confusing the idea of treating a business entity like a person with other kinds of questions of justice that we can ask about institutions themselves, which we can. We can absolutely do that. We talk about it with respect to governments. We talk about just and unjust governments <clears throat> and their social institutions, like we talked about with the social contract theory on Tuesday. And businesses are social institutions as well. They're systems of cooperation um, with rules and procedures and policies and consequences and all of the things that are <clears throat> Uh, well, not all of them, but a lot of the things that overlap with things like government institutions. There are some important differences. Friedman's going to talk about that, and Boatwright will too. <clears throat> but, <clears throat> man, sorry, I got a frog in my throat. Mm. We're going to talk about that topic, but much later down the road. Like, what are the kinds of standards that we could hold social institutions accountable to when it comes to standards of justice? Um, what we're focused on in the fiduciary duty debate is a somewhat limited scope of a question here. It's not like we don't care about the other things too, but we're thinking, what other responsibilities, the ethical and moral responsibilities of managers? Anybody who's entrusted with any power or control over a part of the company or all of the company, whatever it is, it doesn't have to be the top level CEO kind of thing. Um, it could be like middle management like we talked about on Tuesday with Hotsnas. But anyone who is an employee of a company who has some kind of power over how that company operates. What are their responsibilities? In other words, what is the ethical way to use that power, to use that control? They're not allowed to just do whatever they want with it just because they've been given that job. There are restrictions on what would be an appropriate use of that power. 
And that's what this debate is about. Stockholder theory says not just that um, you can't, uh, it's not required for you to be concerned about social responsibilities or benefiting the rest of society. It's that you can't be concerned about that if you're going to be an ethical and moral manager. To do otherwise would be do something immoral. Like that's that's why stockholder theory is a moral theory. Stakeholder theory, social contract theory are going to say no. Actually, some of the responsibilities of managers are in light of what happens to people who are not the stockholders. There are moral and ethical responsibilities to these other people that are affected by the operation of the business, and um, that should also be informing the ethical manager's decisions. Okay, So that's where the big sp spat is. Um, there were some people at this afternoon who we were trying to clarify that the stockholder theory is not saying something like money is the most important thing in life or that ethical responsibilities don't matter or virtue who cares about virtue this isn't the stockholder theory isn't the way that I mean there is this kind of culture in the business world and even people who are not in it kind of perceive it this way that the business world is kind of this amoral jungle that's like the business world just doesn't work on ethics but that's what I've had students in the past who are like, business ethics, well, that's an oxymoron. Like, you can't have ethics in the business world at all. But that's just not what goes on. Um, that is false. <laughs> that's a quick part of it. But the stockholder theory is also not that. It's not a rationalization of that perspective. The perspective that there are no moral rules when it comes to the business world is a very absurd position. It's, it's pretty much impossible to defend. So... Um, it's, that's why you're not seeing any papers about it or any commentary on it. Um, but I did want to address that kind of perspective um, by talking about some of these other things like psychological egoism, which has a very similar kind of result, or relativism. These are positions that would just shut down any kind of ethical inquiry into any part of life, much less business. Um, but I, we could also maybe say even if people in the business world aren't respecting ethics, that doesn't mean that they shouldn't, right? It, even if the business world was completely amoral, which it isn't, and it's actually trending in a different direction. There's a lot more interest and enthusiasm among managers today about ethical business practice than there was five years ago, even 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, this has been a, a kind of trend of, and there's actually conferences about it now where like, just managers go to conferences to talk about how you can run your business effectively and still ethically. Um, how to like balance stakeholder concerns and stuff like that. Um, to become more informed and make better decisions in light of that stuff. But let's just say, let's just grant for the sake of argument, that the entire business world really was amoral. That everyone's just like, it's just about power and money, that's it. And whatever you can do that's not breaking the laws and getting the government down your throat, um, to, to get an edge up on the competition and make more money for you and the stockholders, like uh, that the company is basically a bunch of people banding together to fight for a mutual self-interest kind of thing. Even if you had that kind of rampant perspective going on everywhere, without exceptions, that still wouldn't make it that there aren't moral dimensions to business. It's just that people are neglecting them. They're not thinking about them. But that doesn't mean they're, they aren't there. Similar to how, <clears throat> I think I mentioned this in one of the, maybe the Kant lecture, or it may, and I think it came up earlier. It was something, maybe when you talk about moral realism, about how um, we, we can't uh, actually, we sometimes talk as though like a government or something took away someone's rights. And they can't actually do that. They could violate someone's moral rights, but they can't take them away. If you took away someone's moral rights, then a violation of them would now no longer count as immoral because there isn't there telling you that it's wrong. Right? So even when people's rights, like their human rights, like the right not to be murdered, killed, tortured, you know, uh, enslaved, all that kind of stuff, when those things happen to people, they still have their rights. They're just being violated. And that's how we know that there's something unjust going on, right? that there's something contrary to justice there. Um, so a similar thing here. Um, so that was trying to head off at the past some of the things that came up in conversation this afternoon with my other class. Um, while I've been talking, anyone in chat, um, any other kind of questions emerging for you or things that you'd like to clarify before we get into Friedman?
All right. Um, nothing happening for questions, so let's uh, let's dive right into Friedman here. And I'm going to pull up my lecture notes here. Uh, if you um, are on the Canvas chat, then I would recommend, kind of like with the Hosnos thing, pulling up the lecture notes from um, from the Canvas files section. Um, and you can kind of follow along a little bit here. Uh, <clears throat> my lectures are, now that we're kind of out of the um, crash course sort of thing, we're going to be moving a little more methodically and uh, kind of really breaking down arguments and the replies and the objections and all that kind of stuff. So it's going to be a little bit more uh, detail conscious. I mean, not that I wasn't trying to be detail conscious before, but just these big sweeping surveys of very complicated moral theories just sort of necessitated that. But now that we're getting we're getting a little more fine grained, we've got more focused questions, uh, more focused disagreements, and um, so following along in detail I think will be helpful here. But Friedman's going to be defending um, the stockholder theory. Um, and that's kind of the uh, the irony of his, the title of his paper, right? That the social responsibility of a business is to increase its profits. Um, it's kind of tongue in cheek. <clears throat> that's not normally what you think is the social responsibility, and he's sort of playing fast and loose with that. But what he's trying to indicate here is that he thinks the it'd be maybe more accurately rephrased as saying that Friedman's position as a stockholder theorist is that the one and only moral responsibility of managers, the exclusive moral obligation that exhausts all of the obligations of managers, is in most cases, if you're not working for a nonprofit, if you're working for a for-profit company, it's to increase profits. Anything that you do um, purposefully that is going to take away from the bottom line is wrong, immoral, unjust, not virtuous. That's, that's a mistake, a moral mistake for Friedman and for stockholder theorists. And the basic idea of it <clears throat> goes back to the hot dog example that the manager is an agent acting on behalf of the employers, the stockholders, the people that are owning the company, that own the stuff that the manager is managing. Okay? So um, Friedman's going to say no, as a stockholder theorist, that there's no room for these other social responsibilities, and they have to restrict themselves to just that function and purpose. But what are the arguments that he's going to offer here? And I think there's really kind of three arguments here. There's what he calls a political argument, the market argument, and then this, uh, I don't know exactly what to call it, maybe democratic argument. Uh, it's really actually a social justice argument. Um, a lot of times uh, the term social justice in a contemporary setting, like today, I wouldn't have said this a few years ago, but definitely now, um, the term social justice has now been associated with particular views of social justice. Particularly, um, I would say, the most common associations are with anything that's kind of socialist um, and concerned about like the 99% versus the 1% kind of stuff, like wealth inequality, things of that nature, and issues around um, uh, kind of progressive rights and tolerance and things of that nature. And so if you've ever heard the term on the internet, social justice warrior, it's usually, ref it's a pejorative term to refer to people like this. And I, I think some people are trying to own the term, but most often when I see it used, it's used as an insult, a way to refer to those kinds of perspectives. And what sometimes is lost is that right or wrong, the people who disagree with those kinds of progressive senses of social justice are themselves adopting a view of social justice. Like social justice, if you're, uh, say the, the most, um, extreme kind of free speech defender who, you know, doesn't think that hate speech is uh, a crime or shouldn't be a crime or stuff like that. I mean, even stuff that's on that end, they're concerned about social justice too. We're all having the same discussion here about this thing of what does a just society look like, okay? So um, I think Friedman is going to bring in at the end here an argument that has to do with a certain vision of what social justice ought to look like that the stockholder theory he thinks respects better than its competitors. So those are the three arguments, political argument, market argument, and then this argument from social justice. Um, to get started here, uh, Friedman uses, well, I guess we should say this. I needed to say this. I almost forgot. In trying to understand Friedman, Friedman is a very... How do I put this? 
he writes in a very evocative, um, inflammatory rhetorical style. Like it's loaded. We're probably not going to read anything the rest of this quarter that is as, uh, <clears throat> like kind of like you can hear this voice in Friedman's writing. Um, and other writers are going to be a little bit more professional. Um, Friedman's like just shy, if not crossing the line on things like name calling and stuff like that. And I mean, there's definitely some danger here of ad hominem and straw manning and all that kind of stuff because it's, it kind of reads almost like a rant. I mean, Friedman's a smart guy. I mean, he's a professional economist, philosopher, you know, et cetera. So I'm not trying to say he's some kind of dummy or something like that, but he definitely writes in this much more inflammatory style than and, and maybe slightly less professional, you might say, um, as just the style of getting his ideas across. And I think in some ways that doesn't serve him, at least for the getting being understood properly. <laughs> he reads kind of like a polemic. And um, I think part of the confusions that we, we were kind of working through with my other class earlier this afternoon had to do with people kind of reacting and responding to the rhetoric and not necessarily the ideas. And I actually had another student on the break who was like, yeah, I have to be careful with Friedman because when I'm reading him, I'm like, man, that makes sense. And then when you broke it down in class and like said, here are the arguments, then I was like, oh, that doesn't quite actually look as rationally compelling as I thought. And that's always the danger with rhetoric. That rhetoric is like like spin doctoring is, is a rhetorical exertion. Um, that we can make something look better than it actually is. When if it was just stated in a more blunt, flat, neutral kind of way of speaking, then you just see, oh, this is supposed to be justified on the basis of these claims. Does that make sense? Then it doesn't, um, it, it might actually be easier to evaluate the merits of the argument fairly and the merits of the position more fairly than when, there, when there's all this rhetorical baggage that's loaded with it. And I think it also contributes to misunderstanding, and that's what happened, I think, a, a little bit with my class earlier today. But Friedman, I mean, if you're, you might like it, right? You might be like, yeah, that's what I'm talking about, right? Like Friedman is like, you know, calling it, calling it straight, right? Like this is exactly the feelings I have about this too. You might, your perspective might align with his and you're like, yeah, I, this is a really powerful way to express my feelings and thoughts too. But if you don't agree with the position, then you're probably pretty turned off by it. <laughs> and that might also cause you to misunderstand what's going on. But either way, I want to say that Friedman's arguments are both like try to get rid of or filter out whatever you can about just the rhetoric being a source of why it's compelling or not compelling and just look at the arguments and there are some arguments here that have some weight to them I mean they're they're not um, they're not just rationalizations or excuses I think I think that's the fair thing to take away from this and the arguments that Friedman brought up I and mean, this is 1994 they're still very relevant to the conversation today. You still got a lot of people with this kind of perspective running around that aren't just doing it as a way to, like I said, rationalize their own lifestyles or whatever, but that there's something compelling about this. There are a lot of libertarians out there these days, that, and libertarians are very much in line, like Friedman is, is in that world, in that world of a vision of social justice, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not like the values that he's pulling from to try to justify his position are all that antithetical to anyone who would be strongly opposed to stockholder theory. And that's part of why the arguments I'm willing to say, here like this, there's something compelling about them. Are they ultimately the most rationally justifiable position? Well, that's another matter, right? Um, someone could be dropping some legitimate points on the table of the debate, and yet there are countervailing considerations or gaps in the reasoning or things that aren't on the radar that should be on the radar that are going to overwhelm whatever merit those arguments have. I mean, we have to kind of look at this all things considered and sort it out rather than just, do you like this idea or not? Well, if you like it, then you better be a stockholder theorist or something like that. So um, I think there, I wouldn't have given you, I don't give you trash to read in this class. Like the curriculum is all um, stuff that has serious argument in it. So even if, I guess my bottom line for this whole prefacing is if Friedman looks like he's just a blog ranter who's just going off like, like your crazy uncle on Facebook or something like that, it's not just that. It's not like don't let the rhetoric deceive you here. There are some uh, actual legitimate moral arguments. Whether they're ultimately convincing or not is a whole nother matter. And this is actually kind of another reason why, even though I am no fan of the stockholder theory, I am pers personally I'm totally opposed to it. I I wanted to give an introduction to it uh, to this whole debate from Hosnas because I like how Hosnas is like, look, 
the stockholder theory just gets beat up like a punching bag by a lot of business ethicists. But we got to take this stuff more seriously. Just because people don't like it anymore in the business ethics community, that it's not in vogue anymore, people there's not a lot of people defending it, doesn't mean that the arguments have actually been defeated, right, or that they've been responded to. So I think it, it's worth looking at the arguments straight. If you really don't like the stockholder theory, then it's good to try to understand the best possible arguments that they could use to justify themselves and address those head on. That's going to be the most effective way to argue against it if you don't like it. And if you do like it, um, Friedman's got some of the more reasonable ways of trying to defend a view like this than some of the other things I've seen, like especially ones that try to argue it from a like amoralist perspective or something like that. That's not going to fly. That's not going to get off the ground. But but Friedman is really appealing to actual moral values. Okay, so which ones? Let's take a look. Um, this first, uh, so he kind of frames it with some of this again charged rhetorical language that if a manager is of a company is um, exerting social responsibilities, if they see themselves as beholden to social responsibilities and then make company decisions and policy, certain actions, use of resources in alliance with that, then what they're effectively doing is performing all the functions of the government, imposing taxes and deciding how to spend those taxes. And I, I think Friedman has a, an appeal to a basic intuition that he thinks we're going to have that there's something unfair about this. And kind of going back to Hosnas's pony that he's writing the whole time, uh, consent. This is some kind of violation of consensual agreements. It's a kind of betrayal. It's a breaking of a promise. Right, that the manager takes in virtue of accepting the position. If you don't like what the company is up to, if you don't like what the stockholders are wanting you to do, then Friedman, someone like Friedman would just say, don't take the job. As soon as you take the job, you put yourself under a fiduciary duty. You're kind of making a promise that if I take this job, if you give me all this power, I'm going to use it in the way you want it to be used, stockholders. So if you don't want to be in that position, if you don't feel morally comfortable with that, then don't take the job. Now, uh, that might not strike you as totally satisfying because it's like, well, okay, who's going to take those jobs then? Maybe people who are not going to run businesses in a way that is tracking or concerned about what happens to the rest of society based on how they run their business. Um, and that's going to be a real concern here. But more on that later. Uh, we'll get to that with Bo Ray. Okay. Um, this first argument, though, is the first like really explicit, robust argument Friedman offers is the political argument. And it basically boils down to this, that if... Exerting social responsibility does mean spending other people's money here, and it, it, it's basically the manager performing the functions that the government performs, then for them to do this is short-circuiting circuit, the political process. It's undermining the legitimacy of our own government. Um, if we think about uh, the justifiable standards for how the government is supposed to exert its political function uh, in a democracy, you get these sentiments like, no taxation without representation. I, he, Friedman quotes this. And we're saying, like, a social institution shouldn't be making decisions for how society is going to be set up without the people being able to have a say in that. And managers are just able to act unilaterally based on what they want to do with the company's resources that they have power over. Um, the, the kind of implicit argument here is that the government is supposed to be the institution in society that performs these functions. And the only way those functions can be performed justly is with democratic representation, the sort of the respect for people's autonomy, the, all the citizens. That voting, having a vote, uh, is a way for you to have a say to participate in the decisions that end up affecting you. Okay? Even if democracy is a pretty ham-fisted way of doing this, it gives it's better than other forms of society in which people have no say, right? When it's just like a dictatorship or an oligarchy or something like that. And there are some people who are going to say, well, that's what we're living in today. But, you know, on paper, this isn't supposed to be how it works. Um, and if there's a problem, I mean, usually people are like, we live in an oligarchy today are like, and that's a bad thing. <laughs> and Friedman would be like, yeah, the reason why it's bad is because you don't have representation in what happens to you. You don't have a say in what, what ends up the government can just do whatever it wants. And a business could do the same thing if it's taking on the mantle or the role of doing that. Managers are not elected. Um, and there's no oversight or accountability other than whatever government decides to do in terms of regulation, which we'll get to a little bit later. 
about how that regulation thing is going to come in here. So he thinks um, for managers to exert social responsibilities in the world, of how they use the company's resources, is basically undermining the legitimacy of the government. And it's undermining the legitimacy of this uh, consensual promise-making, promise-keeping with the stockholders. So that's this is a um, deontic type of argument, um, that there are obligations about this. This isn't a consequentialist type of thing. Um, but it's talking about legitimate, just power in society and shaping society. Um, another phrase I'm going to use uh, a little bit later on, and, and definitely with Boatwright, this is actually something Boatwright and Friedman are strangely on the same page about, is that there's a concern about managers who are exerting social responsibilities basically giving themselves the authority of being social engineers. Um, I, I talk with students of all types of political persuasions all across the spectrum. And I've had some more students in the last year or so like complain about uh, or, or sh express concern and fear over thing, people like Jeff Bezos who have like all this power, all the tons of money that they're, they're worried that with people having so much wealth and power in society, they're basically able to shape society based on their own personal values in a way that the rest of us don't get to have a say in. And that isn't democratic, right? And that's un an unjust form of society. That's an unjust way of determining how society is going to be structured for it to happen this way, um, just at the whim of or the values of the people who are in an elite status of power um, that they get to basically just call the shots with no accountability. Um, okay, so that's the first concern. The second argument, this market argument, is really more about consequences. So Friedman's saying this just actually isn't going to work very well. Um, he does talk about this argument about um, having political mechanisms supplant market mechanisms in allocating resources. So that makes um, socialism, like it, that makes managers exerting a social responsibility basically socialists. Um, and, you know, for Friedman, in, it wasn't that long ago, but in 1994, um, especially in conservative circles, you know, just saying the word socialism is like a dirty word. And it's still kind of like that today, although that's, I think, in the process of changing right now, too. But especially like post-Cold War, um, democracy and capitalism are so closely associated with each other that something like, um, just saying, well, look, this basically fits the pattern of socialism was almost a reductio ad absurdum argument in itself. In other words, all you had to do was show that some ethical system entails socialism and people are like, okay, well, that's wrong. And I, I wish this went a little bit further, and, and we will talk about this more um, later in the quarter. So I'm kind of, if you want to talk more about that, kind of stick a pin into it. We're going to get back to that when we talk about social and economic justice at the end of the quarter. But um, there still is a question about, you know, what kind of way that society allocates resources is actually going to produce the most good. Hasnas talked about this a little bit with the whole Adam Smith invisible hand thing of neoclassical economic theory. Um, that if you let free markets where people make consensual exchanges, if you let those determine prices, you're going to have the most efficient market. You're going to have resources going to the place that they're going to do the most good and have the biggest bang for your buck, basically. Um, in contributing to people's welfare and their happiness. Uh, as Hasnas pointed out, not many people are drinking that Kool-Aid anymore. They're, they're just very skeptical that that's actually how this is all going to work out. Um, and so uh, there's this kind of line of reasoning is really not very convincing to most people anymore. That's just like it rests on uh, claims, descriptive claims, about how economies are going to function that just don't seem to be accurate. They're not making accurate predictions here. But I think Friedman, even if that's off the table, he still has an argument here. Here's one of them. He says, CEOs and managers don't have the wisdom to make decisions about social welfare. And like you said, this is the, the proper uh, wheelhouse for politics. And if you think about how it happens in the government, um, it's not just politicians like a single politician crafting legislation. They have a whole team of people and think tanks that are doing all this research to try to anticipate what if we had this law? What if we had this policy? What are going to be the effects on people in society? How is that all going to shake out? Now, certainly not all of politics is that sincere, but that is a part of it. And if you really wanted to kind of uh, do the most good, right, to have the most consequences happen, it's going to take a lot of that. And a CEO doesn't have that. They don't have the bandwidth for it. They don't have the training for it. They're not educated for this. 
Um, so they would make bad decisions. Okay, um, that's the that's the argument here. Now I mentioned how there's more interest nowadays with um, business people wanting to be able to run businesses that also are kind of more like social contract theorists or stakeholder theorists that they they want to integrate social responsibilities in how they manage their companies um, and part of these conferences are basically trying to educate managers about the knowledge that they need in order to make judgment calls like this to be able to learn from mistakes that have been made in the past and traps to fall into about how you try to do good um, and what to do with it but I, I think there's there's two points to be made about this one so maybe I should turn my hat. This is kind of me responding to Friedman a little bit or trying to flesh out more of the debate. One, if they aren't, if they don't have the wisdom to make decisions about social welfare, and that's a reason to not allow them to have these kinds of social responsibilities, that could be overcome with just giving them that wisdom. If there's something we could do about that, if they could get the proper kind of education, um, if that was a priority for good managers, then presumably that could be overcome. That's one thing. The other thing is that there's ways in which a company may not have to do that. Like they may not have to make policy decisions about what's best for society. It might be as simple as just donating money that the company is like part of, like kind of the, um, maybe you know about tithing. It's something religious people sometimes do, but I actually have some non-religious friends who also tithe to charitable causes. It's like take 10% of your income every time you get a paycheck and you donate it. I do this with my church and, and I know other people do this with other nonprofits too. You could imagine a, a company thinking, hey, it's our responsibility to contribute to the rest of society, so we're just going to take a big chunk, big tithe out of our profits and donate it to other organizations that we know are doing, are no, going to know what to do with that to make the best impact happen. happen. So it might not be that the manager needs to know everything about this in order to, to make that good happen. Um, there's actually uh, one of the really cool things the last five years, ten years, maybe as far as ten, but definitely the last five, is there's now um, a lot more resources uh, where you can like check up on nonprofits and see what they actually do with your money and how they're managed, whether there's any concerns about what they're doing, like basically which charitable causes are really legit and actually making a difference and which ones are not. To kind of like, if you're going to donate money to uh, try to make good things happen in the world, there's there's some vetting process for that. There's some peer review that happens now to know where to send it so you're not just throwing it into something fake, uh, like a phony foundation or something like that. So maybe those kinds of concerns could be overcome. Um, then Friedman makes a really weird argument that if CEOs or managers do try to exert social responsibility, they're just going to be fired because the stockholders want profit and if the person's not going to do that they're just going to get rid of them and I say well what kind of argument is this I mean that's not a that can't really be a argument for what ought to happen right it's just going to say it's not going to happen that it's just a statement of pessimism about people's ability to be responsive to moral matters not um, something that tells us what those moral sensitivities ought to be so I hope you kind of rolled your eyes at when you heard that argument <laughs> because it's not really a significant one. It might be something that a, a, a manager, like a human being who is put in this position, has to think about for themselves. In other words, there's a complicating factor. It's like, well, I recognize that I have some ethical responsibilities, these social responsibilities, the same as stakeholder theorists, right? But I'm like, man, I got to be careful how I do this because my ass is on the line, basically. Um, that if I step out too far on that, um, I, I might get fired because uh, they want to, the board of directors and stockholders want someone in there who's going to maximize money a little bit more. Um, maybe, maybe um, that would be a test of your own personal virtue. Are you willing to take a risk of your own livelihood in order to do what's right? And that's an important question too, but a different one from what we're talking about. Um, we're trying to just think about what these responsibilities are um, and not necessarily about, depending on the circumstances in which the rest of the world is operating, does it kind of, how, how much is it reasonable to ask this of someone? That's a separate kind of debate around morality. Take for instance, like, it's wrong to lie, cheat, steal, kill, rob, you know, all this kind of stuff. But if you lived in a society where everyone's doing this all the time, like some Mad Max universe or something, it would be really hard to act morally. 
um, in a kind of post-apocalyptic environment, it would be really tricky to have that kind of virtue because it's going to cost something. Or to make it not so fantastic, imagine that you're a, a German citizen in Nazi Germany when the Nazis are in rise to power. Um, you don't sympathize with the Nazis. You're like, this is immoral and unjust and wrong, but what, what am I going to do? Right? If I speak out about this, I'm going to be killed. All my friends and family are going to be killed. Um, what, what do you, what's the right thing to do in that situation? That's a tough moral dilemma. And I have some thoughts about that, of course, <laughs> as any good ethicist should. But that would be, a, I'm saying that this would be a distraction or a tangent away from the debate that's happening here. So let's get on to the last argument here. This is the really big one. So um, back to this theme about the circumventing of the government. Um, I, I like this metaphor of um, the managers in kind of Friedman's view here. Managers who exert social responsibility are being kind of social vigilantes. You know, it's an extra legal act that they're kind of doing. Not necessarily that they're violating laws, but they're kind of taking the responsibility, the mantle of responsibility for doing justice away from the rest of um, the institutions that we have under the government that are legitimately given that mandate to do. So it's kind of like being Batman or something. Um, now there's a, an extension of that argument, that concern, about an undermining free society. And this is what I was alluding to earlier as the social justice argument. So it's a little different here from being like, you're pulling the rug out from underneath or undermining the legitimacy of the government, but also that um, if, you, if you're gonna have, if you're gonna say to managers, look, it's ethical for you to exert social responsibilities, to use company resources for these kinds of purposes, then the next step it may not be immediate, but the next kind of natural and logical step here will be to create some kind of legal protection about this. If we really think that's right, then we'd want that set up in our society. I mean, one thing I can kind of extrapolate here is is back to the idea that the managers that exert social responsibility are just going to be fired. Well, you could imagine there being some laws or regulations that protect managers from that kind of uh, retaliatory firing. That if the only reason for firing the person is that they're not maximizing profits more because they're concerned about the environment or other social issues, um, that that can't be a legitimate reason for firing. As Boatwright's going to talk about, there are laws that protect managers from being fired by the board of directors for all sorts of superfluous reasons, especially in, in uh, second-guessing their business judgments. You cannot fire a manager for just because things didn't turn out good. If there's some kind of negligence in their duties or something like that, that can be cause for firing. But there are legal protections here for CEOs um, that they can't just be fired because they happen to do badly. It's not like, um, uh, say, the sports world, where like frequently uh, a head coach will just be fired because the team lost. And it's be like, yeah, it's a losing season. We're just going to get rid of the coach. Coach might be doing a great job. Um, they may, they might not just had in talent, luck might have not been on their side, but they look at that win-loss record and they're like, you're out of here. Um, that kind of thing does not happen at the highest levels of management um, in the business world. Um, it, it doesn't happen as frequently because there are some legal protections here. So you could imagine the same thing happening to try to protect managers from being fired for uh, reasons like they're just concerned about ethical issues in society. But if that happened, the more that this happens, and the more that we're okay with that, that we give a stamp of approval onto that through the government, through regulations, then that's going to start undermining free society, according to Milton Friedman. How does this work? Well, the basic idea here is that you're not really allowed to do what you want with what you have. Stockholders have this money. If they want to invest in a company and have someone manage that money to make more money, that's their prerogative. They've already paid their taxes. So they've, they've paid their dues, and whatever they have remaining, they're entitled to do whatever they want with. And to say, to have rules about this, or to allow some other party, this manager, to come in and be like, no, you can't do what you want with this, I'm going to decide what, you do, what happens with this, takes away this economic freedom, this ability to uh, do what you want with what you have. It violates private property rights, basically, or not entirely, but it compromises them. That if you choose to invest in a company, now in a certain way you've given up um, control over what happens with your property. 
And this is going to be a big theme that um, Boatwright's going to talk about and, and the basis of his analysis of stockholder, the fiduciary duty to the stockholders and stockholder theory more generally. Um, he's going to make an emphasis about how actually the relationship's a little more complicated than this like hot dog stand ownership thing that is where the stockholder theorists and Milton Friedman's appeals, I think, make the most sense. Um, just like I said, the social justice stuff we're going to talk a lot more about later on down the road here. But just as like a sneak preview here, um, there's definitely room to uh, disagree and debate with whether economic freedom is the real foundation of free society. Or to what extent, especially in the current situation and circumstances of our economy, the way our economy is actually running right now, whether uh, that is the most important sort of space of freedom and whether there's not other senses of freedom that maybe having a system that protects economic freedom then ends up violating. So we're going to talk a lot about that, but I, I definitely, um, because Boatwright's not going to get into this directly, so I want to kind of indicate that Friedman's position here on the logic behind what makes for a free society is not itself uncontroversial. So there, there is debate about this, and there are different visions for what that's supposed to look like, and what whether a just society has uh, put so much emphasis on this particular type of moral value. Is economic freedom a certain type of freedom? Is it a way in which we can express our autonomy and be respected as autonomous agents? Yes. But the story might be more complicated than that, too. Um, so, we'll, we'll, like I said, we'll, we'll talk a lot more about that stuff later. Um, final note here I've got is this kind of I think this really, it's almost a joke to me. There's a kind of irony to all this. Um, Friedman says that, uh, you know, the, the only responsibility of managers is to increase profits, to maximize profits. That's their duty, That's the, and that's coming from the fiduciary duty to the stockholders. And that exhausts all of the moral space here for ethical management. Um, but then he says, you know, there are ways in which um, promoting uh, a, a socially responsible image of the company might actually increase profits. Uh, like you've heard of this concept of like people voting with their dollar, right? They want to support companies that they think are making good change in society, that support causes that they agree with or that are doing good. They, they want to basically kind of subsidize that effort with the where they give their what they give their business to, right? This is a way consumers can influence companies by which ones that they make viable and don't make viable based on their spending habits. Um, so once companies get wind of that, that, oh, this is something that p consumers in the market are, are interested in, this is a preference that they have, um, then they're going to start trying to exploit that. And um, Friedman is saying, well, I can't say that's wrong because all they're doing is really trying to maximize profit, right, by being socially interested. Um, he says he admires anyone who has disdain for such tactics as approaching fraud. Not that it is fraud, but it's just kind of headed in that direction. It's like kind of dishonest. It's not the full truth. It's not being transparent about it. Now, the reason that this is funny is for two reasons that I think are noteworthy. One, he has to use language so carefully here because he can't say that this is wrong. His theory doesn't allow it. Um, because the motivation in this sort of situation is profit maximizing. That's exactly what Friedman is saying those managers ought to do, and this is just another means at their disposal. But the other thing that's kind of funny to me is that Friedman has some sense here of fair dealings that aren't just predicated on uh, people's profit motive, <laughs> right? Of like respecting these fiduciary duties. He just, he can't actually express it. His, the rest of his commitments theoretically don't allow for this. Um, so that, that, that makes me giggle a little bit. Um, okay, so that's, that's what I've got to say about Friedman. Um, we're an hour in here. Uh, I want to check in again with anyone in the chat of how things are going. Um, if you've got any kind of questions about all the stuff going on with Friedman, the arguments that he's offering, um, and then after we maybe talk about that or well, at, we can do that after the break, too. I, I think we might take a break here. And then the second half of the lecture tonight will be on Boatwright. So how are we doing, chat? Oh, 
Well, I feel like I've got some hanging thread here too. While you're, if you've got thinking about any questions you have, people are in the chat tonight. Um, I'm gonna try to pull up this hanging thread I got. Something's nagging me in the back of my mind. Remember it. Hmm. I can't remember, but um, looks like no one in the chat is putting anything down here. Um, let me know if you've got questions. I'll keep asking, I, and I'll continue to keep asking. Um, maybe I just kind of, in leaving Friedman here, I want to emphasize how Friedman saying that there's the this whole space of ethical responsibilities of managers is exhausted by the fiduciary duty, that that is backed up with moral values that are not just like greed is good or something like that, right? Um, but the, the values that Friedman is explicitly appealing to are what's actually best for society in terms of the consequences of like what actually will do the most good. Do you want to have managers, you know, getting into this business of trying to improve social conditions? Um, a concern about the undermining of the legitimacy of our government um, and democratic processes, and then this concern about whether it also undermines free society and this value on freedom um, and liberty and being able to have agency in the world and to basically, um, through your own personal means, be able to craft a life that you choose to live. And you can't ever do that perfectly, like Friedman talks about how there is some conformity to laws that are required to make society function. But the goal in his mind is to try to keep those as minimal as possible. So this is this is classic libertarian politics too. The same moral values are, are happening here of like small government, right? Government stays out of your business as much as possible. They're gonna have to get into your business a little bit, otherwise you won't have fire departments and you won't, I mean, there's some hardcore libertarians who think you they should be privately funded by local communities, but, um, you know, you won't have road repair. You, you know, there's some libertarians who'd argue that too. But uh, things like an army to protect the national sovereignty, um, running a monetary system, all those kinds of things you need a government for. So there, and preventing murder and rape and stuff like that. That uh, and being able to create a free market. That's the big one. Without the government enforcing some kind of social conformity, um, you won't be able to have the kind of robust free economy that neoclassical economic uh, economists really are looking for. Okay, I think that's I think that might have been the, the hanging thread. But um, let's take a break, uh, a short break here. And um, anyone who's in the chat, I mean, if there's any questions at all, I'm begging you, give me questions. If there's anything I can clarify, don't be afraid of asking the dumb question or anything like that. Um, the dumb questions are always my favorites. I, oftentimes they're way more insightful and get us uh, to talk about things that are more important to talk about than the like cl really clever intellectual questions or something like that. So um, please don't be shy about that. I'm here to help. And um, and as I've said before, like people in chat, you are offering a service to everyone who's watching this on YouTube later because they're not going to be able to ask the questions. You're here now. You're able to do that. So think of yourself as an agent with a fiduciary duty on behalf of everyone who is absent here tonight. Okay, all right, let's take a break and uh, we'll be back in a little while. All right, so getting into Boatwright here. Um, Boatwright is kind of interesting to figure out where to place in this debate. Like if we're thinking about Hasnas' framing of stockholder theorists, stakeholder theorists, and social contract theorists, you know, where does, where does Boatwright fit here? He's definitely arguing for a side. But the, I mean, the clearest bead you could get on what his position is, is not stockholder theory. <laughs> Basically, the main argumentative uh, agenda that, um, that Boatwright has here is arguing for the legitimacy of a, a space here for social responsibilities. Um, that's what he's interested in. And on what terms would that be justified? Um, he has a kind of... Um, a weird conclusion, but I think we'll kind of get to it when we get to it. Um, I'll, I'll leave that for just something that'll naturally emerge as we're, as I'm going through the lecture here. But um, I think there's the closest fit for Boatwright would probably be stakeholder theory. Stakeholder theory seems to be 
m more of the logic that fits with the arguments that he ends up offering. Um, there's, uh, but it's a, it's a little ambiguous here. I mean, he brings up social contract theory a couple times, and there's a way in which um, his position could be understood from a social contract perspective as well. Um, but it, I think the main thing to hear is to see he's a dialectical opponent for Friedman. So we get kind of two sides of the debate here a little bit. And there's probably some other arguments and positions in here too that, and, and I encourage you to, to like explore that and think about that. Um, if you, anyone in chat wants to share things like that, you can bring it up as we're going through this, or it could be something to reflect on for a journal for this week. Um, any of that would be great. Um, this is, there, there's just so much ground to cover on these debates, and as, uh, this class is kind of an introduction to business ethics, so, um, getting a basic idea of what are some of the big considerations in the debate is my objective with the curriculum. But there's, this definitely doesn't, these theorists are not exhausting everything that there could possibly be said about it, for sure. And the debate could definitely go further. But um, let's get to boat right here. So uh, under this kind of um, argumentative ambition that he's, he's trying to critically evaluate uh, stockholder theory, he's interested in asking this question of why should we think even if we accept the fiduciary duty to the stockholders as being morally relevant, that there, there is some way in which what happens to stockholders matters and should matter to the manager in making business decisions about how to utilize company resources. Boatwright's interested in the logical feature of stockholder theory that says that is all there is to it. That basically, if you allow for the fiduciary duty, that exhausts any, it takes up all this moral space, and there's nothing left over for other types of, we might even say fiduciary responsibilities, just not fiduciary duties to stockholders, but to other, maybe, stakeholders. And that's what we saw from Hosnoss's uh, presentation of stakeholder theory. Man, my nose is really itchy. Well, I'm teaching business ethics, but it's not like I do a bunch of cocaine. Just really itchy nose. Um... <laughs> Um, maybe too much coffee, but um, Boatwright is interested in about that exclusivity. So as we saw from Hosnoss's treatment of stakeholder theory, you know, there's a way in which the stakeholder theorists might talk about how the manager needs to act as if they are an agent or representative protecting the interests of anyone who could be affected by the business and, where possible, allowing those people to have some kind of voice or say in business governance and business management. Um, and in those places where that's not a viable option, then the, the manager can still anticipate what their interests would be or what their concerns would be. Like if um, an industrial plant is like trying to make a decision about how much uh, they want to reduce their carbon emissions, right? Other people in the world would maybe have a stake in what happens there because of how they could be affected by it. And the manager can pretty reasonably anticipate what those concerns would be, like gauging environmental impact. Yeah, so that'd be an example. So one way that I, I like to frame up the dialectic here as, as Boatwright is considering it is to say, um, yes, we're going to grant that there's some way in which a manager is responsible to stockholders or shareholders is Boatwright. Shareholder, stockholder, same thing, same thing. Um, yes, there is that kind of duty. But couldn't there be others? What makes the fiduciary duty to stockholders a special relationship that is then ex basically the exclusive duty of the manager? That's how he's going to approach this. So Boatwright's going to dig really deeply into how that could be justified. What is it that makes the shareholders or stockholders special? Right? What's so special about shareholders? Um, so he's going to explore ways that that could be argued for and then basically try to debunk them. And I can, at, at a kind of broad strokes level here, before we dive into the details, um, I think the quickest way I could summarize what Boatwright's up to with his strategy here is to say, you know, that simplistic scenario of the hot dog stand, the hot dog cart, where um, it seems like, yeah, there's a really clear fiduciary duty that does have this exclusive status, but basically, the conditions under which that kind of fiduciary relationship would make sense is not the conditions under which uh, businesses operate that uh, basically have publicly traded stocks. 
that it's the circumstances of big corporations and how um, stocks work that doesn't justify adapting that model over into what to do with uh, corporate managers. Um, that it just doesn't fit the, the right description. It doesn't meet the conditions. Not to deny that these sorts of fiduciary duties could happen, but that they just don't apply into these cases. That it'd be improper to take the kinds of moral intuitions that Friedman is bringing up and apply them into this particular context. That's a kind of subtle type of argument. Um, it's an interesting one, that, that, and we'll have to see how Boatwright cashes that out in the details. But I would say that, that it would be the quickest way I could summarize um, Boatwright, is, is not to take issue with the kinds of moral values that are behind this stuff, but to say they don't, they don't actually, the conditions under which those would be relevant are not the conditions that we're dealing with in the business world. Boatwright's going to explore four different ways in which um, a fiduciary duty to stockholders could make moral sense. And the fourth one is not going to, is the one that he's going to kind of endorse, but it's not so friendly to stockholder theory. The first three are the ones that would be really friendly to stockholder theory, but those are the ones he's going to try to debunk. And those three are to see the reason why the, relate, the duty to the stockholders or shareholders is so morally important has to do with the fact that they're owners, that the manager is an agent who operates on behalf of them, um, and the third one is a matter of uh, respecting consensual agreements, which we saw was a pretty big deal for, for uh, Friedman. So let's take a look at those in turn. Um, Boatwright's going to try to explain the plausibility of this, but then, like I said, debunk it. So let's look at the ownership thing. So uh, kind of going back to this intuition, like private property rights, like I should be allowed to do what I want with what's mine, right? If I own or if you own, I think the way I set up the scenario is, if you own the hot dog cart and you hire me to manage it, I mean, you have complete control over this hot dog cart. You can do what you want with it. And just because you hire me to manage it, um, the, your, me being the manager is really an extension of your ownership. And that's why I, as a manager, is sort of beholden to you to respect what you want done with your property kind of thing. That That's the basic logic there. But... Um, this this is something Boatwright sort of concedes may have been a accurate way of capturing the moral landscape for certain types of private enterprise in the past, where like financiers made business ventures directly possible through direct investment. Maybe kind of like imagining someone putting up uh, capital for a startup. Right? In that kind of situation, Boatwright's like, yeah, you might have a point. But that's not how things are really working with most companies, especially when there's stocks and shares involved with it. So there's a distinction um, Boatwright wants to make between ownership of personal assets and ownership of a corporation. And there's a big asymmetry here in terms of control. So in my toy case about the, the um, hot dog cart, like you own it like you've got the deed for the cart right like you it's your property and you have complete control if i'm the manager running the hot dog cart and you come over and you eat a hot dog out of it and i'm like are you gonna pay for that And you're like i own this cart man i'm like okay yeah no that's fair right you can do whatever you want if you want to be like oh i ran out of mustard at home i'm gonna take one of the mustard bottles from the hot dog cart and take it home like you can do that like you own everything that's going on with that hot dog cart but when you buy stock in a company, you don't have control over that company and what's happening in there. Um, you're not, uh, like Boatwright points out, stockholders are not allowed to use resources of the corporation um, as if they were personal assets. Whereas in the case of the hot dog cart, you can. right? So that's a big, big difference there. And uh, he says there's evidence that uh, in the legal set setup that we've got right now, that what he's saying makes absolute sense, that this is an accurate reflection of how things actually stand. Because the, we actually have laws to protect shareholder interests in the company. And he brings up, the just to just cite a couple examples here, the right to elect a board of directors and the right to the dividends from the company's profits. If they had complete control over the company, and could do whatever they want with the resources there, you wouldn't need to put these legal protections in place. 
they'd already have it by just this being their property, right? So where this is kind of all going um, eventually, to kind of let some of the cat out of the bag here, is that from Bolt Wright's perspective, if you're a stockholder in, say, Amazon or Apple or Facebook or any, any of these bigger corporations, GM, Ford, whatever, whatever it is, you're not an owner of the company. You're an owner of the stock, and that's it. <laughs> that's all that you really have ownership and control over. Um, is that sort of uh, aspect to it. You don't have ownership over the buildings, the office spaces. You can't, you can't go into, if you're like, I'm, I'm a, um, you know, I bought five shares from Amazon, I can't go over to their offices down in Seattle and be like, I'm taking this computer for, me, for myself. Right? That would be illegal for you to do, right? So that's more evidence here that stockholders don't really have control over the company. So the sense in which they're owners of the company, he's really trying to challenge that. Now, he's saying, of course, these rights of ownership don't logically entail that managers need to act in the only the interests of the stockholders. Again, this kind of exclusive duty to the stockholders. To the fact that a, a shareholder has the right to elect a board of directors and right to the dividends from the company's profits, those in themselves do not justify an exclusive fiduciary duty. It doesn't say that the managers need to only be concerned about the interests of the stockholders. But if that wasn't, uh, and I've got a little note here about like, don't don't take this too f extremely here to say that there's a logical gap here. It's not that there's no way it could be rationally connected, just that acknowledging these rights doesn't automatically prove in itself that the exclusive duty to the stockholders is the way managers have to go. But what could do it? How would you bridge that logical gap? How could you add an argument in there to say, on the basis of this, yeah, there does need to be this exclusive uh, duty to the stockholders on the part of the management? One argument that Boatwright offers here is what he calls the equity argument. Um, that basically, investors are at risk. Those poor investors, they're throwing their money into this company, and how, how are they going to be protected from, doing, from all the risks that could be involved with that? I mean, I'm being a little dramatic here about it, but... You know, Boatwright's trying to point out that, you know, this is this is a potential legitimate concern here that someone could raise, um, that um, people that invest in companies by buying stocks are really taking a risk, um, and they don't have other kinds of protections about this. So maybe because we'd be interested in um, encouraging investment, you know, it would help people would be more confident about investing in the company if they knew that managers have one duty and one duty only, and that's to make a return on that investment for the, for the stockholders, to maximize profits, right? That would encourage more investment. Um, I point out that it, it's, it's worth noticing, again, why we did all this big ethical theory. This is a consequentialist consideration, this risk of harm. And basically, that's why I was like, those poor shareholders, like, they're financially at risk by investing in the company. I mean, it does make them more vulnerable to negative consequences. But um, again, why we study these big ethical theories, if you wanted to start saying like, well, out of concern for harm, you should be you know, having these special protections for the stockholders, it's going to very easily extend into concern for other stakeholders since they might also be at risk in, based on how the company is run. Um, so once you start opening the justification on these terms, then that entails probably other responsibilities that managers should be sensitive to that have to do with the pattern or thinking of risk of harm. And that's exactly what Boatwright um, replies with, that even if this is true, um, that doesn't give grounds for the conclusion that the manager's fiduciary duties are to shareholders alone. So this, this is also why I'm thinking, if Boatwright's going to fit somewhere, it's probably stakeholder theory, because this is what stakeholder theory says. Like, you, the manager has to be concerned with the interests of everyone who would be affected or possibly affected by the operation of the business. Stakeholders, or, uh, stockholders are stakeholders. They are a party that has an investment in what's going on with the company. And to be concerned about the risks to them and the possible benefits is something that a manager should be concerned about. But why be concerned about that exclusively? That's the thing that Boatwright's really asking about and challenging. And he has some ways to, to say a little bit more here of just that, well, it's not logically entailed. 
but why this shouldn't be a pretty serious concern. In other words, in in the concern about all these stakeholders, the stockholders aren't going to be a huge blip on that radar. Why? Well, because of these three things. One, there are existing shareholder rights that do give some protection. The right to elect the board of, of uh, directors and the right to company, uh, the the um, dividends of company profits, right? So that's already sort of protecting their interests there. It's not like you buy stock and then just hope that the company ends up, you know, fulfilling its promise to pay you out of whatever profit that they make. I mean, there's there's legal binding um, policy, there, there's law there to to make sure that companies uh, fill, fulfill their their end of that bargain. So maybe that's enough. But there's another, this is the argument I think that really kind of seals the deal. I, or I guess I should say, in my opinion, I think the strongest argument that Boatwright has here is the second one. That if we're concerned about the financial risk on the part of the investors, there's a huge mechanism that is available to them to help protect their risks. And that's the stock market themselves, uh, itself, right? I'm going to have to sneeze again. Woo! Big sneeze. So how does the stock market, the existence of the stock market, help ameliorate financial risk to investors? Well, as, as uh, Boatwright points out, like if you don't like the way this stock is looking, you can always ditch it and buy some other stock. So you always have that option. You're not, it's not like when you buy stock, you are wedded to this company for all time or something like that. You can always mix it up if you want to. Um, oh, I'm going to pause the video because of the noise here. All right, I just wanted to make sure that car noise didn't overpower whatever I was saying. Okay, so um, you can always ditch stocks you don't like. You're not invested in the company for all time. Um, and also, I think Boatwright makes a good point here. He says, like, as long as you've got a diverse enough stock portfolio, you can really hedge those risks, right? You, there, And it's sort of like on you as the investor. Like, if you want to invest in a riskier company, then you know, there might be a higher payoff there. Um, but it's like higher risk, higher reward. It, it's your choice about what you want to do with that. No one is forcing you to have to uh, invest in these companies and make yourself vulnerable in this way. It's something that you choose to do with the hope of some kind of payoff. And then finally, that I, I really like this quote. I put it in the lecture notes. He says, indeed, managers and employees of firms, and maybe even we might extend it to people in the surrounding community, generally have far more at stake in the success of the corporation than the shareholders do. And in terms of how they're vulnerable to what happens with the business, if we're talking about risk of harm, usually it's other stakeholders that are have way more vulnerability here, that their lives could be impacted in much deeper ways than the way the stockholders are going to be affected by the operation of that company. Now certainly if you're like lower middle class or something like that and you just put all your money into the stocks of one company and then it goes bankrupt like that's going to ruin you like that's going to be a really big deal um, but those are not the normal cases here um, and there's there's lots of other ways in which um, these other stakeholders can easily have higher considerations now it's always going to be a case-by-case -case thing with consequentialism so you know the way that a stakeholder theory would encourage a manager to think about that is like well, you got to know the circumstances and how people might be more or less affected. That's like all this stuff about the utilitarian calculus, right? It's adaptable, it's it's uh, flexible, and it responds to changes in circumstances um, very nimbly in terms of making recommendations about what to do. But once you got that sort of setup, you don't have stockholder theory anymore. You don't have this exclusive duty to the stockholders. And then finally, there's this idea I mentioned earlier about how stockholders are only owners of stock, not owners of the company. Um, I think one point I, I wanted to bring up here is Boatwright observes how usually, uh, this will be relevant for later on too, that like stockholders don't buy it from the company. They, I mean, maybe initially when a company first gets on the market and they're offering stock, then that happens. But more, more often than not, the stocks are just traded from you, you, people who already had it. You buy the stock from someone who previously owned it, right? Um, that might make it uh, seem more apt or appropriate to describe what's happening here as just owning the stock. That's it. You're buying the right to dividends of profits, and that's it. Um, if that was true, if that's accepted, then there wouldn't be any further basis for 
understanding why what happens to the stockholders needs to override the considerations of every other potential stakeholder. Okay, so that's the first the first uh, possible line of defense here for um, this exclusive duty to to the stockholders. Let's look at the next one. Oh, and by the way, chat. Uh, how did it go there with this uh, argument about ownership? How are we doing with that? Before I go on to the next next big fish to fry. Okay, so for this um, next line of possible argumentation to defend stockholder theory, Hasnas brings up this stuff about contracts. And I think this is, this is a pretty important part of the paper just because both Hasnas and Friedman made a big deal about this, about how morally significant it is to respect the sort of free, non-coercive agreements people make with each other. And the ultimate justification of this is really going back to these deontic duties not only the ones that you place yourself under when you make a promise, but also the way in which everyone else, like no one else should be interfering with that out of respect for autonomy. So this is going to be like loosely connected with a kind of Kantian framework of respecting the dignity of people to be self-determining and to make decisions for their own lives rather than having it all paternalistically managed by the government or by social engineer CEOs who are exerting social responsibility or stuff like that. So it might be that the by making this sort of agreement between the manager or CEO and the stockholders, um, that, that that is the basis, it's that agreement that becomes the basis of why they have to have this exclusive special fiduciary duty to the stockholders. That basically anything else is, is um, violating a promise that's sort of made. So that's why, again, I like my hot dog uh, cart example to get inside the stockholder theorist's head, like the logic that they're offering, because it's like we sit down and you as the owner of the hot dog cart are like, hey Tim, I don't want to be doing running the hot dog stand all the time. Um, I want to hire you to do that. But if I'm going to trust you with that, like here's how I want the hot dog stand run. Like, do you promise to do that? If I give you the power over the hot dog cart, like are you going to do it the way I want? And I say, yes as like a condition of accepting the, jo the job being even offered to me in the first place. And if I say yes to that and I agree to it, now I've put myself under those duties. Now I have to respect your wishes because that's the terms on which I was even given the control. So it's sort of like if I'm not fulfilling my end of the bargain, then I'm not operating ethically or appropriately here. Uh, and it would be right to like if you wanted to fire me or something like that. Now again, the question is, can that moral situation, which is understandable and I, I would argue is intuitive, um, can it be applied to the world of business? That's um, what Boatwright's always like checking up on. Like, does this fit? Um, let me, before I get into it in the business world, let's talk about, um, oh, no, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, I'm getting ahead of myself. I always do this when I do the lecture on Boatwright. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Okay, so this is different from the equity argument that we just looked at because this was a consequentialist thing. Now we're talking about a deontic thing. So it's like the difference between mill, utilitarianism, Kant, and these absolute duties, right? Um, so we're talking about promise making, promise keeping. Um, first problem here, and this should sound a little familiar from Hasnas talking about social contract theory. Uh, first problem here is no contract. <laughs> there just isn't one. And just like Hasnas set it up when he was talking about social contract theory, there's three types of contracts that can exist. Explicit contracts, like y you own the hot dog cart and you sign, you say, I hereby grant, you know, blah, blah, blah. Tim can manage, he has the rightful management of this thing. And I say, I agree to accepting this power under the responsibility of maximizing profits. Or something. Like if we had a contract there, a legally binding document that we explicitly made this agreement um, or even if it was something like we talked about it explicitly and shook hands over it. I mean, in terms of morality here, morality is not restricted to just what's law, lawful uh, or what can be exhibited in the law. 
But if we make the, if I make that kind of promise, even if I just say it to you, you're like, yes, I'm going to attempt to maximize profits. I'm not going to be distracted by any other purpose. That's the way I know that you want this thing run. That's what I promise to do. Boom. That mean that that kind of fits the bill here for an explicit contract. Um, and but that's not happening. When you buy stock from a company, you don't like talk to the company and be like, okay, so I'm thinking about buying your stock. Um, do you promise to run this company CEO in the way that I want it run to maximize my profit? I mean, there just isn't that kind of interaction space. And there isn't even the space for the implicit contract too, which we do have legal standards to express as well. And again, it's not limited to this legal stuff, but we can think about um, how even if I don't say, yes, I solemnly swear, I promise to do this sort of thing, um, that there could still be a kind of implicit understanding here um, that would work there. But because there's absolutely no interaction space, even implicit contracts require some usually precedent of interaction with an expectation for it to continue. So it might be an explicit contract that starts and you just don't renew it, but there's sort of the expectation this is going to continue. This happens a lot with like implicit contracts happening with contractors, um, things like that. Uh, but because there's no interaction between managers and stockholders, um, Boatwright claims like there isn't the grounds here to talk about an implicit contract either. There, there's no way to defend that. There's one other option though, and we talked about this with Hosnos. There could be a quasi-contract, right? And that's how social contract was uh, social contract theory was operating. Is like you the managers should operate as if the legitimacy of the business is dependent on it fulfilling its end of an imaginary contract that exists between the business and society. And if there was something that wanted to happen here, there's logical space for that, right? Like the stockholder theorists can say, you know, a manager should act as if there had been this kind of agreement between the stockholders and the manager. But then the question is, like Hosnos brought up for social contract theory, how do you justify saying that that's the ideal way to operate, to pretend as if that had happened? The legitimacy of a quasi-contract can't come from the kind of moral bindingness of promise-making, promise-keeping that attaches to explicit or implicit contracts. And there's, while it's not impossible for the stockholder theorists to defend things in this way, Boatwright doesn't think it's going to look good for them if they start trying to do something like a quasi-contract or a social contract. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, so <clears throat> without the opportunity for negotiation or interaction, um, he thinks stockholders are offered stock on a take-it-or-leave-it basis. There's not, um, there's not any excuse or justification for thinking about there being even an imaginary negotiation happening here. It's like if you want to invest in the company, that's your choice. You don't have to, right? And uh, they don't exert any kind of control, so they can't be like, well, I'm going to withhold this money unless you agree, and then we come to a kind of agreement about this. Like the company can do what it's going to do even if you don't buy its stock, right, under most cases. Um, the other thing, though, here is um, to say that if you're going to go down the social contract route, it becomes really hard how to imagine why the considerations of the business's relationship ideally with the stockholders is going to ignore and not take into consideration imaginary contracts with everyone else in society. Most, well, I mean, we're going to talk about social contract theories a lot more later on, deeper into the quarter. I keep promising this, but it's there are these broader issues we will be getting into and and uh, pursuing. Um, but as we're going to see when we get there, that most social contract theories require some kind of imaginary conversation that happens with everybody in society, not just a select elite few like the people who are capable of putting up capital for venture enterprises, uh, like investing in buying stocks, things like that. Okay, so um, that's Boatwright's issue with... Um, trying to talk about the central importance of contracts and promise making, promise keeping. And it, again, it goes back to this like, that's just not what's happening. There aren't contracts between managers and stockholders. So that can't be appealed to as a basis for what responsibilities the manager has. And then finally we have agency. 
Um, and I want to I want to talk a little bit more about this outside of the business context. So um, there's two really classic examples of fiduciary duties that understand it uh, in in this context of agency of and what we mean by that is someone acting as an agent on another's behalf. Um, one of those and, and they're kind of related, um, but there there's circumstances in which they can be pulled apart. One of them would be surrogate decision making in the medical world. So normally we want patients to be able to make decisions about their own treatment and health care, um, but sometimes you've got people in conditions where they're not able to make an autonomous decision. In other words, they're not able to make a decision about their health care that would be in line with their enduring aims and values. That's a phrase biomedical ethicists use all the time to talk about the surrogacy problem. And there, there's two conditions under which this might happen. A person is in so much pain um, or they're so doped up on medication that they basically can't think straight. Right? They're, they're going to be reactive in their decision making and not choose something that's really in line with what they ultimately care about in their life, um, what their real values are. Uh, the, the, think about like the way Kant talks about how inclinations take away from being self-determining through reason. Right? There are cases in which those inclinations are flared up so intensely that they can compromise a person's ability to be self-determining. The other kind of scenario is when they just don't have it at all, like they're in a coma or something. Right? A car accident, person's in a coma. What do you do? Right? They're unconscious. Um, what should be done with their care? Well, because they're the person who is, it's the term here, the technical term is incompetent, not as an insult or something. They're just not in a position to be able to competently express their own agency or be self-determining. Then we've got to appoint someone else to make the decision, and that's going to be a surrogate. But the surrogates that are appointed are not supposed to make a decision based on what they want, but based on what they have understanding of as the patient's enduring aims and values. So they basically act as a proxy for the person's own agency with respect to themselves. So if I'm incompetent, I'm in a coma, and they're like, what do we do with this person? Like, do we keep them on the respirator or not? Like, do we take them off the respirator, life support? What are we going to do? I, you can't ask me. You can't say, what would you want, Tim? Because I'm in a coma. I can't, I can't think or answer. <laughs> but you could talk to somebody else who knows me and knows my values. Um, and they could be like, oh, well, you know, Tim has never said anything directly here, but he ha I've been talking to him, or, or maybe I have. I mentioned it one time. I'm like, if this ever happened to me, like, this is what I'd want to have happen. And I don't put it in any kind of legal – I don't make a living will or something like that legally. Um, but you're like, I, I know what Tim wants here. Or you're like, I've just had enough conversations with him. I know him so well as a person. I know – I can kind of extrapolate what he would wish to have happen here. Um, so then, then that decision is the one that would be taken. But even though the person is not making the judgment themselves, we're still able to respect their autonomy as something morally valuable through the the kind of surrogate decision making. And that's and that's the cool thing about surrogacy. The other context in which this can happen is durable power of attorney, which you might be somewhat familiar with. Um, and I think the durable power of attorney example might even fit even better for understanding the arguments that Boatwright's going to set up here. So there's ways in which uh, I have this kind of legal status in the eyes of the government and the law about making decisions about um, basically what's going to happen to me in certain contexts. Um, that can involve like medical decision making, but it can also mean other things like um, what whether I'm going to... Um, uh, sign over a deed to my house or something, right? Like, normally, if I own the house, I don't own a house. I don't know when I will. But if I did, like, if I was a homeowner, only I can uh, give up my ownership willingly to somebody else, right? That's the, that's the only way it could happen. Unless I've appointed you as my durable power of attorney, in which case now you get to do things like that. You get to make those kinds of decisions, and they will be respected as if they were mine. Okay, but in a case of durable power of attorney, there's definitely room for abuse of that, uh, which is something you may hear about. Like sometimes people who are getting older and losing some of their mental faculties are vulnerable and exploited by people who somehow are able to like hoodwink them into signing over power of attorney or like determining you know, how, what, what's going to be their will when they die, like where, where's all their property and money going to go, things like that, right? 
Um, but the basic, the, the legitimacy of a durable power of attorney is this idea of agency. And how does it happen? Well, let's let's use, keep the durable power of attorney in the back of your mind here, and let's go through the conditions that Boatwright's talking about here, about how an agency relationship and how someone can be now morally obligated to act in the interests of somebody else as their proxy, how that situation could come into being. The first one is that it would require consent. I can't decide to be your power of attorney just because I want to be. And you can't decide for me to be your power of attorney without my agreement. Like, even if you want me to have this power to make decisions on your behalf, I have to agree to it for it to actually be binding. So there has to be mutual consent here. The other thing is that there has to be power given to the agent to act on the other person's behalf. It doesn't make sense to have durable power of attorney if having that status doesn't empower you to make any actual decisions. And then finally, there's this element of control. Especially in the case of durable power of attorney, I can only bestow onto you powers that I rightfully and legitimately already have. Right? So just as a really trivial case, just because I appoint you as my durable power of attorney, so you could make decisions about like signing over the deed to my house to somebody else, like selling it or something like that, um, that doesn't give you the power to sell my neighbor's house, right? Because that's not something I have control over. I don't have control over my neighbor's house, so I can't give that over to you. I, I can basically only give you the power to act about things that I rightfully have legitimate control and and power over. Okay, so that's this third condition. And on all of these, uh, Boatwright's answer is basically to say, this isn't happening with stockholders and managers. Right? They, the, their relationship does not meet these conditions for, for seeing the manager as an agent of the stockholders. Instead, what makes more sense, and especially from a legal point of view, is to see managers as agents of the company. They're entrusted with the operation of the company, not the execution of the wishes of the stockholders. That's Boatwright's main, main argument here. Now, what is the interest of the company? Well, that's really open. And that can include concern about stockholders, but maybe other stakeholders as well, right? That wouldn't get you to see the manager as an agent of the company wouldn't get you this exclusive fiduciary duty to only the stockholders and the stockholders only. Okay. So how is this going to work out? Well, in terms of the consent, Boatwright's already argued that there's no opportunity for an expression of consent here because there's no interaction between stockholders and managers. That just doesn't happen. The second thing is that managers aren't given certain powers that, and this is kind of the weakest point that Boatwright makes, but uh, in my opinion, but Boatwright says, you know, if we were going to see managers as real agents operating on behalf of the stockholders, then they should be given certain powers that they're not actually in fact given. Like managers can't make decisions about uh, merging, changing bylaws, those require shareholder approval to make those things happen. So it's like if I gave you... <laughs> Um, again, man imagining like durable power of attorney, but it doesn't mean anything, right? It doesn't let you make uh, really impactful decisions. Um, then it's not really fair to say that you're an agent acting on my behalf or something. And then finally, this element of control. And this, this is where it might start sounding like the argument, the first argument about ownership. There is a connection here. But the basic gist of the argument here is that because stockholders don't have control over the company, in a lot of respects, like he says, they really just have control over the stock and the rights of toward the dividends of the profits kind of stuff. Um, they can't, the stockholders can't give over control to the managers of something they don't already have, which they don't. <laughs> that's, that's Boatwright's claim there, that like um, stockholders are not owners of the company. They can't rightfully be seen that way. Um, so it's not like they can that, that it's theirs, and so they can relinquish that power to the manager. The manager's like, you're not giving me this, right? It's not on the basis of the stockholders that I'm given the position and the power that I have. It's independent of that. Um, so that's why, the, in Boatwright's view, the manager doesn't have to see themselves as exclusively beholden to the will of the stockholders in, a, in the way that it would kind of make sense in, say, the hot dog cart example where you really do have total control over the hot dog cart, and then to give me the job of managing that cart for you, you do have control over it, so you're allowed to be able to confer that onto me to act as your agent on your behalf. 
but but that's not the boat right saying that's just not what's happening with corporations okay um <clears throat> all right um i think i'm gonna move on here just uh there, there's another little wrinkle here but um uh yeah, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna kind of move directly into the last part of the argument here for the sake of time, since we're already at uh, 9:35 here, and we're coming up on an hour and 45 minutes on the recording. Um, maybe before I, I do this last little bit of boat right, I want to check back in here um, with uh, the chat here. Oh, I missed this text here from Amber. Uh, kind of reminds me of surrogate with pregnancies. Yes, yes, very much so. Um, so. Yeah, uh, the idea of being an agent on behalf of somebody else, um, to, to have that kind of really deeply binding fiduciary duty. If someone kind of agrees to this, um, of, of, um, of being a surrogate for a pregnancy, now they, they have placed themselves under certain obligations. Um, normally, we have this, uh, well, rightfully we ought to have this bodily autonomy. We have complete decision making about what happens with our own physical bodies and we kind of in broader sense of civil rights and social justice think uh, a society that isn't allowing that space to happen that kind of sovereignty over what happens to your own body is violating a basic human right here but once someone agrees to doing something in this sort of way then it's different it's not like they have complete freedom anymore but that's because they freely agreed to put themselves under that kind of situation. And the stockholder theorist is saying that about the managers, that when they decide to take the job, they basically have signed up to be agents on behalf of the stockholders. And then Boatwright's like, yeah, that's not what's really going on here. Okay. But the, the basic logic of why acting as an agent, if you were an agent for somebody else, then you'd be put under these kind of deep fiduciary obligations that does make sense. Like Boatwright's not challenging that. He's just saying it doesn't fit to the relationship between managers and stockholders. Yeah. Any any other questions, things coming up from people in chat? How's this going? We're really getting into some like nitty gritty details here. I expect lots of questions. If this is making sense for you, great. If it's not making sense for you, that is totally understandable. If, if there's some uh, things that are unclear, like we're doing some some kind of fine-grained logic chopping and, and these are more complex theoretical points that are being made here in the back and forth of this debate. So it's tricky stuff. That's why I'm always like, I want to help you, give you support about uh, in your efforts at trying to understand this stuff. So let me know how I can I can be helpful about that. Um, I've got actually, ah, man, I feel like a broken record on some of this stuff. I hope I'm not getting too annoying by talking about it all the time. But I, I've had some some conversations and interactions with people from the 360 class that give me a kind of impression that maybe there's more going on that I'm not kind of witnessing or having transparent access to where people are feeling kind of like insecure about how much they're understanding, but they don't want to speak out about it or ask about it or reach out to me to talk about it. Um, the kind of hesitation, some maybe shyness, I don't know, but um, something's holding the back. But if you're if you're like not happy about your level of understanding with the material, if you're like this is this is maybe interesting to you, or you're just like I maybe I'm not that interested, but I recognize its importance, or I just want to get the most out of this class that I can. I want to like have the most robust educational product here at the end, um, and it's not where you'd want it to be. Um, I mean, I hope I've been advertising myself adequately and sufficiently here about how invested I'm in that kind of project and that intention on your part. Um, I want to match that that commitment, so please, please let me do that. Give me the opportunity to do that. It's a very sincere request for me to do so. Um, okay, I'm not seeing anything in the chat, um, so I'm going to just finish this off here. Uh, oh, and by the way, let, before I forget about it, since I remembered right now, let's do a code word, um, and let's do um, let's do motorbike. I'm out here next to my uh, there's my neighbor's motorbike out here, so that'll be the code word tonight. Motorbike. We had um, Starfleet last time, now we got motorbike motorbike this time, so maybe not vehicles next time, but uh, there we go. Um, motorbike is the code word. For tonight's lecture. 
All right, let's let's pick this up. So there, I, I mentioned there's Friedman or phew, ooh, it's getting late. Boatwright is going to talk about four ways in which there'd be the justification for a fiduciary duty to stockholders, and to make it somewhat exclusive. And the first three, he thinks, nope, those don't those don't actually hold water. They don't make sense. They are irrelevant. They don't apply to this situation. But then there's one more that he wants to, another way that we could appeal to this. And this is what I was saying is kind of like a little little goofy. It's a it's a little strange. You might not have anticipated this style or line of reasoning. Um, but that's to appeal to the legitimacy is coming from public policy. Uh, let me pause the video for one second. Sorry for the interruption. Okay, so um, in this fourth way of trying to justify it, Boatwright wants to appeal to basically public interest. So this is another thing that makes me think he's really focused around stakeholder theory. That that's that's how Boatwright that's what his sort of final position is really premised on. Um, is that whatever is going to be the right way for managers to operate, it's going to be justified based on what's good for everyone who could possibly be affected. And this is where Boatwright is sort of interestingly uh, syncing up with some of Friedman's concerns. Then basically the concern about uh, CEOs becoming social engineers. That if we open up this line of letting them exert social responsibilities and try to make the world a better place, well, that kind of depends on their vision of what is a better place, and that this might circumvent um, political mechanisms, democracy, stuff like that. Uh, there's a kind of um, consequentialist concern uh, about giving managers not only these responsibilities, but then the kind of mandate to be able to exert that responsibility. That's the kind of two-edged sword of social responsibilities is not just that we're allowing for them to contribute to society which is a good thing but that we're also kind of saying it's legitimate for them to operate that way so by giving them the responsibility we're also giving them the legitimacy of doing that um so uh it's sort of it's it's sort of boatwright's position here is to say the safest bet for the concern of everyone involved, we're not thinking just about the stockholders here, is for us to have a policy where managers are sort of restricted in their mandate to just maximizing profits. That that's the safest bet, to like restrict them to that. Um, so we want to avoid this risk of abuse. We don't want to give managers this kind of unaccountable absolute power for social engineering. So he says, the present state of corporate governance is not ideal. Right? It would be better if businesses were able to be more integrated into concern for other stakeholders, things like that. Um, but it's a workable arrangement. Now, you might already have some skeptical thoughts about this line of response from Boatwright. And I don't think that all the rest of Boatwright's argumentation here, especially his criticisms of stockholder theory, are dependent on you agreeing with him about this last point. Um, if by by setting uh, it on the foundations of public policy and the public uh, pu public interest, um, the general interest of basically welfare of society, um, that definitely opens the door for a contingency about this recommendation. For example, if none other, <laughs> environmental ethics, that would be a big one. So if we were going to say, okay, for the sake of the public good, managers only be concerned about maximizing profits that's going to be the best way to do that well if that maximizing profit means um contributing to more human caused climate change which is going to just wreck a, people's economies and their lives and maybe the viability of humanity on the planet blah 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 that's a pretty serious public interest that we might be willing to make some risks here to accommodate and and that would be easily um, held in check by legal regulations from the government like say carbon taxes or restrictions on the amount of emissions that companies are allowed to make um, taxing them for this sort of stuff in order to create funds to make repairs to the environment those are very straightforward ways in which uh, we could be asking managers to be exerting social responsibility in the interests of other stakeholders that aren't going to have a huge risk here of this kind of social engineering on the part of the managers, where there's like no checks and balances on what they're up to here. Um, and be, especially because the stakes are so high. Um, 
it's uh, we. I'm gonna be. I've always been tempted to throw uh, an environmental ethics unit into this business ethics class, and I'm actually still kind of hemming and hawing about it. I've been thinking about it uh, for man, the last four months <laughs> in preparation for teaching this quarter. And I'm just like, what do I cut? What do I cut to make room for it? I'm not sure, but I'm trying to integrate it along the way here. Um, if you are a climate skeptic, let's talk. I'm happy to have that conversation with you. Um, but I I don't think that there's uh, a lot of grounds, argumentative grounds for doubting the reality of human-caused climate change. And I'm, I'm happy to kind of come out and state that. And if you've got arguments to the contrary, I'm very happy to look at the evidence of it. But it'd be like, we have to look at all the evidence for this. Um, and vague accusations of bias or something like that are, are just not enough to cut it, uh, to, to uh, undermine the evidence that's available to us about what's going on. And a very interesting and recent development to all this is that economists themselves have been getting in on the game. And right now, the projected economic costs of human-caused climate change are extremely high. And now even like fiscal conservatives have more of a motivation to be concerned about environmental policies just because it's not just a matter of caring for nature or future generations, but economies are now going to be greatly at risk because of the kinds of environmental changes that are going to be occurring. Um, whether that's uh, the acidity of the oceans affecting fishing, um, whether it's rising sea levels um, that are going to destroy infrastructure, whether that's uh, fossil fuel reliance making um, our uh, energy output not economically viable anymore when there are cheaper alternatives um, through carbon neutral means, all that kind of stuff. There are, there are economic considerations for being concerned about that, but for the manager, they'd still have to be concerned about those kind of stakeholder interests if that was going to be something that's going to affect a decision that is going to affect the bottom line of the company, right? the, the present profitability of the company. To have that kind of more um, far-ranging anticipation of, of future consequences. Um, as just a one final little note on this point, and then I, I promise I'm going to move off of this to finish things up here. Um, what has been very telling to me is how um, fossil fuel corporations have started offloading their stocks. That tells me something. <laughs> that it's not just uh, it's not just a bunch of liberal hippies who have this kind of bias about environmental interests or a democratic agenda or something like that, like Democrats like, as opposed to Republicans. Um, but it's when when the fossil fuel companies themselves are selling off the stock that otherwise they normally would retain. Um, they know the market conditions are going to start looking bad for that. Um, that there's going to be some major consequences to, to what's going on there. So that they're anticipating. So that was that was something I recently became aware of, and I was like, oh boy, that that definitely that's another piece of evidence right there. <laughs> kind of changes the state of the game, uh, moves the needle a little bit. Okay, but we're coming up here on two hours, so um, there there are. I'm just using environmental interests here as one example. There can be other interests too, like issues around civil rights that might be so great um, that we would be concerned about, we, we might be willing to give some kind of uh, of this like legitimate authority over to managers to affect what's going to happen in society, even though there's some risk of abuse there, but the risk of not doing anything or, or having it them just have this policy of maximizing profits is going to make for something really terrible, some kind of moral tragedy. Once we're in this fourth argument from Boatwright, the ultimate court of appeal here is just like what, it, what makes the most sense for the public interest for all the stakeholders taken together. And that's going to make the decision here about what we should do. One final point I would like to make about this, um, so maybe I'll turn my hat for this one. Um, when I've thought about this for myself, and I've been teaching this class for like six, seven years now, so I've had lots of opportunity to reflect on these arguments, I'm sort of struck by something about this, this kind of overlap between Boatwright and Friedman about how we don't want to have managers exerting this kind of social engineering function, this kind of thing. It strikes me. And you might find this in a kind of a compelling way of thinking, too. I'd be curious what you think of my thoughts here as well, have some discussion about it. But um, there, see, it strikes me that whether we give them this mandate or not, they're going to still have it. So 
society is going to be affected one way or the other. By having uh, managers running companies where profit is the bottom line, like the bottom line is the bottom line for that company's operation, that is going to have a social engineering effect. And there's no way to get around that. Um, it's even more noticeable in some special circumstances that have happened more recently, like say Facebook, um, that it's not just about the profitability of that business venture, but by because of their interest in making it more profitable, the kind of service that they're providing drastically changes what it is to be a human in today's world, like how we actually live. It changes the way we understand our relationships with each other. It changes the way in which we think about the space of interaction, of public discourse, of all sorts of things. Um, businesses are not just sideshows of like the kids doing a lemonade stand on the corner. It's like, oh, that's so cute. They're like being entrepreneurs. Businesses create products and services that do affect how our societies evolve and what it is to live, like the environment in which we live in. And there's really no getting around that. And to say, well, we don't want to give them this power of being social engineers, well, if we say, don't do that, they're still going to be doing that. And, and when I've been reflecting on this, I'm like, I don't see how you get around this problem, at least with the proposals on the table. Um, it's going to be one thing or another. And one reason for maybe thinking more in the direction of something like government regulation, uh, even though a lot of people are afraid of the government, is like, what would you be more afraid of? The government, at least, is subject to some kind of accountability through democracy, through votes. Businesses are not. Big corporations, they don't, they don't have to, uh, except in special cases, um, do any kind of referendum with the citizens in the area in which they operate. Usually, the most that that happens would be like a case like uh, New York, where Amazon wanted to open up another <clears throat> um, headquarters, and people in the community were like, hell no, we don't want them here. And so they couldn't do it. Right? That there was a political will against it. They had to get that kind of permission from people, and they didn't get it. Um, so it didn't happen. But once they're there, there usually isn't any check on them, unless the government steps in to do something there. So. Personally, I'm not a huge fan of how democracy is currently embodied in the United States government. Um, there's a lot of ways in which it could be improved in terms of its democracy, <clears throat> gerrymandering, <clears throat> stuff like that. Um, but uh, at least there's some accountability there. And there's some hope for like being able to work with that to make it more a system of proper accountability here for issues of social justice and how people are going to be affected by the way in which society is running. Um, to leave it as just like free markets deregulated, I mean, those companies are going to be the, le the social leaders of tomorrow, uh, especially as corporations grow and become bigger. It's just, so it's kind of like pick your poison with the way it stands right now, unless we did something different. So um, I wanted to just throw that little reflection in there too is something that I think is relevant to this debate. Um, it might not be as easy as Boatwright and, and, and uh, Friedman are making it out to be of like, just don't let them do that, and then we're able to hedge our uh, those risks, uh, we're able to avoid those risks. Okay, um, that's it for tonight, I think, unless anybody in the chat has other questions you want to ask, anything to clarify here, any comments, things that you'd want to have some discussion about, anything you want to ask me about, um, I'm open to, to doing a little bit more here. I'm going to pause the video and chat. You can. Uh, so Daria had a question here. I just was talking to her. Um, and she was wondering about basic bottom line here, is profit more valuable than human life? And Daria, feel free to jump in here on your microphone if you want to clarify anything or, or ask more of a question or develop it. Um, but the first way I'd want to respond to this question is, at least for the, the debate between stockholder, stakeholder, and social contract theories, none of them are saying that profits are more important than people. None of, even stockholder theory isn't saying that. It might be somewhat questionable whether stockholder theory is the best way for us to express our concern for people over profit, right? Um, but the stockholder theorists, I mean, when we were looking at Friedman's arguments, he's only concerned with these values of respecting people's autonomy, their freedom, uh, acknowledging and respecting consensual non-coercive agreements with each other. That's all about the moral value of people, right? 
So for that the manager has these responsibilities to pursue profit as the bottom line is really out of respect for people. Now, if you're a stakeholder theorist or someone like Boatwright, you're like, hmm, I'm concerned that the stockholder theory is basically unjustifiably privileging what's valuable about the stockholders over everyone else who's a stakeholder. So the, Daria actually mentioned when I was talking to her about uh, a case of like, say, a company is, uh, and this actually, what was the company that you mentioned as, as the one that actually happened is in California? Uh -huh. it, it, was, it was a real life story about a corporation that is basically poisoning through pollution people in the surrounding area. Water, water supply poison happening? Yeah. And they did this because they were trying to protect their bottom line. It would have been more expensive for them to do something that was more environmentally safe. And uh, so in that kind of situation, um, if the stockholder theory is saying, manager, yep, you did the right thing. That was exactly what you should have done out of respect for these moral values of autonomy and freedom and liberty and a, a free society and democracy and all this kind of stuff. Someone like Boatwright or a stakeholder theorist is going to be like, man, that sounds really hollow when we're talking about people's livelihood over here. Uh, there's There's got to be some acknowledgement of what happens to them that should be informing whether the manager is making a moral or ethical decision about what to do with the company. So uh, that'd be one way to approach it, um, your situation, Daria. Is that kind of getting at what you were you're asking about with your question? Okay. If I'm thinking charitably for the stockholder theorist, I could imagine something like this. So Friedman says that um, managers are, you know, obligated to maximize profits, but in a way that's consistent with the law. And it could be that the government decides uh, that these kinds of uh, um, negligent acts of pollution are actually illegal out of trying to protect people's right to life in society, right? Like basic human right, right to life, right not to be killed, uh, right to health, happiness, you know, this kind of stuff. Um, and it might be in order to protect that legally that the, this is the government's mandate um, to do to protect these values and rights of people that they would then make a law that puts a regulation that says it would be illegal for companies to do this. If they did that, then the stockholder theorist is like, yeah, you're not allowed to pollute. But the kind of maybe counterintuitive thing is that if that isn't a law, then the stockholder theory would be like, go for it. And actually, you're morally obligated to do so. I mean, that might be like, whoa, <laughs> should that, is that really the right moral answer to this question? Um, yeah, that might sound a little more counterintuitive. Um, Theo, anything you want to ask about? Okay, fair enough. I look forward to reading your journal. Um, I'm going to wrap it up here for everyone on YouTube. Um, I hope you're having a good day, whatever you're watching this video or evening or whatever. And don't be shy about contacting me over the weekend if you want to talk on the phone. Love to do that. I always love talking with students. It's a joy every time I get a phone call. So definitely nothing to feel. Don't feel any hesitation to contact me on my account. I always love it. Okay, bye.